Okay, we're live now. This is Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easing, and let's see, today is Sunday, August the 17th, 2014, and we're going to talk about World War Cthulhu today. Um, it is available to order tomorrow, I, if, I, if memory serves. Is that right, guys? Yeah. Uh, there's pre-orders, but the official date is the 19th, so Tuesday. Yeah, okay, so Tuesday, right. Oh, oh that's right. Chris said Tuesday morning. Yeah. Uh, roughly. Um, so this guy here, Brian Sammons and Glenn Barras. I'm saying your last name right, aren't I, Glenn? Uh, I, I said Barras. Barras, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, those these guys are the editors um, of this book, and we've got several of the authors with us. I guess a couple of them, and uh, it was kind of short notice, or I think we'd we'd have had more. But I think Chris uh, wanted to um, have us talk about the book right before it came out, so that's fine. You can only fit so many people in this room anyway. So, and hopefully Joe Pulver will be joining us shortly. He's having a little trouble getting in the room, and as usual, we have uh, Matthew Carpenter here and Pete Rollick here, and Pete is also one of the authors in the book, um, and Neil and Costas, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah. Uh, who wants to go first? You, you can go first. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay. So uh, my name is Const Constantin Paradias, and uh, I submitted the short story The Sinking City for uh, World War Cthulhu. Uh, it's uh, pretty much the story about how uh, Lee end up uh, getting sunk in the first place. And uh, actually, I didn't know what I was getting into the first time because Glenn was the one who suggested I should submit to the anthology. And uh, all of a sudden, I realize I'm in it. And uh, I suddenly see my name in the table of contents next to Cody Goodfellow and uh, Peter Rollick and a bunch of other people. And I just about, you know, uh, lost it. Wow. So for me, it was a big deal. It was like the second big publication. Uh, well, that's a good thing. Especially yeah. next to Peter Rollick. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I should say, um, Chris said we could give away, we're going to give away two print copies of World War Cthulhu today to live viewers. If you're watching this later, um, it's just for live viewers. Um, so stick around. And we're also giving a um, World War Cthulhu package, I think he called it away. Oh, it's... Um, we'll get to you in one second, Neil, but somebody want to explain to me what the package would be? Because I guess that's the big prize. Yeah, is this, it is. Yeah, it it is looks huge. Like oh, yes. yes. Um, if you want, I'll read it from exactly where I got it in just a second. Sure. Do, do, do. Why don't you go to Neil while I find the exact yeah, details? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll be the filler. <laughs> you do that so well. That's why I keep putting you in these books. <laughs> oh, <thank you>. oh. <laughs> wait a minute. That and you're a good writer. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm I'm Neil Baker. Um, my story is called The Turtle. And it's about the first submersible used uh, during the American uh, War of Independence, the uh, Revolutionary War. Sorry. Um, and likewise with Costas, I mean, it was it was a joy to be in this book, uh, surrounded by so many people that I admire. So, yeah, as I've been saying online, this is probably the, the second biggest book of the year for, by far. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. Which one's the first? Oh, The Dark Rites of Cthulhu. Yeah. <laughs> Neil's also the publisher of Dark Rites of Cthulhu. Hashtag. <laughs> and who's the brilliant editor of that other book? Some, oh. yeah, yeah. It's, it's just you know some some model from Maximus something some some male model. I don't even know who what his yeah, name is. Yeah, I'm for his looks. <laughs> Called Simmons, Simmons or something. Uh, he, <laughs> Moonlight of the Piccolo. <laughs> Al Simmons. Uh, yeah. is it? So Brian, what's the what's the World of Cthulhu package, or if I may be saying? Okay. Say where is it? There it is. Okay, if you win this bad boy, you're going to get a signed limited edition hardcover with number request, if that number is still available, that has all 22 illustrations in full color. You're also going to get a special trade paperback edition that also has all 22 illustrations in full color. 
There's going to be the World War Cthulhu color artwork print, and that's going to be signed by artist M. Wayne Miller. You will get a, t -sh a Cthulhu t-shirt, white on gray, in sizes from small all the way up to 3XL. You're going to get a Cthulhu World War Cthulhu bookmark. You're going to get a bonus trade paperback of Lovecraftian fiction published by Dark Regions Press. Now, that's the wild card. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. You're going to get in a... This is a bit of a, an announcement here, but why not? You're going to get an exclusive sneak peek of World War Cthulhu 2. Ooh. That is slated for 2015. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Now, are those stories you already have in hand, or is this going to be a whole new uh, exercise on Kickstarter? This is fresh. From this you. is coming out. And uh, I can't say too much on the details yet, but it's going to be bigger and better than World War Cthulhu. And I mean that in a very literal sense. Now, um, as, far as, the, um, as far as the print edition books, if they don't win the package, in other words, the other two winners, uh, these are print editions also, but can, are, are, those, are the illustrations in this book, can you explain that one to me, what they're getting? Anybody who pre-ordered the Indiegogo or got the special limited edition are going to get all 22 illustrations in full color. Once the Indiegogo campaign editions are gone, what will remain is going to be black and white illustrations. So if you want the full color illustrations from this point on, I believe you will need to get the limited edition signed deluxe hardcover, or at least the limited edition hardcover. Right. I, I, what I'm saying is gone. we're giving away the limited edition to the, the luckiest <laughs> winner, I should say, but two other people are going to win books too, and they'll have the black. Yeah, book. that I don't know, but I do have Chris now mes messaging me with an email. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what Chris told me. I'll um, send him the link, yeah. Okay, good. You already took care of that, Glenn? Yeah, took care of. Good man. So, why don't you start with, uh, how did this, how did World War Cthulhu, uh, okay, if you want to win these books, you have to listen to us blather here for the next little bit, so that's the, that's the trade-off. So, uh, but they're really pretty books, you're going to want them. <laughs> and, you can, and you can read them, too. Um, how did this book come about? I mean, what was the idea behind it? How did it start? Uh... Well, the idea is something I've had in my head for quite a few years. I I like doing mashups of different genres with Lovecraft. And uh, Glenn and I, we've done Steampunk Cthulhu. We've done Cyberpunk Cthulhu in a book called Eldritch Chrome. And I like, I like military stories, be they modern, contemporary military, or stories from, you know, way back ye olden times. I've always been a bit of an armchair general, I guess. So military fiction has always appealed to me. Lovecraft fiction appeals to me, obviously, because I've done a lot of it. Um, and I always thought it would be neat to have to see what would happen in that setting. The idea is this is what happens when mankind stumbles across the mythos. There's there's a hint of that from at the end of uh, Lovecraft's own. Shadow over Innsmouth, where the government comes in and they launch torpedoes at Devil's Reef and they, you know, put the boots to everybody inside the sleepy little town of Innsmouth. And so I always wanted to see more stories like that. What would happen when this is no longer a secret, when it's no longer something dark and hidden? Mm. What would be humanity's reaction to the mythos? Right. But then... From that idea, we started to extrapolate and go, well, you look at the old ones themselves, and they've been making war on each other since time began. You know, the, the critters of the Cthulhu mythos are not one big happy family. Uh, Cthulhu and his spawn made war against the Elder Thing. They made war against the Great Race, and so on and so forth. So that's another aspect. Uh, the central idea is... The Cthulhu mythos has been around since the beginning of time, and so has war. That was as soon as man could pick up a stick and hit somebody else, war was on. So it's taking two eldritch forces and combining them 
and then also seeing what they would be like in the future. The thing about World War Cthulhu is it has stories from the far distant past to the modern day to the far distant future. Right. It was really, our mandate was to look at both Lovecraftian horror and all aspects of war and how the two would intermingle. Um, hey, guys. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, we sorry. You, but we can hear you. That's good enough. So, you're Okay. Good. I'm a little camera shy. <laughs> uh, well, Chris, since you just popped in, why don't you introduce yourself and, and talk about your connection to all this for those that don't know. Sure, my name is Chris Mori. I am the publisher of World War Cthulhu. Um, I run Dark Regions Press, and we had the privilege of publishing this awesome anthology that got expanded into some huge monstrous beast that we didn't expect it to quite get expanded into. But it, uh, you know, it took a longer, a little bit longer production than we expected because of it. But uh, it's it's a beautiful book. It's turning out really great. So could be more pleased. Well, you know what they say, though. People will forget how long it took, but they'll never forget how, how good of a job you did. So it's okay if it's if it runs a little late to get all that extra stuff in exactly. there. Exactly. Better to get it good point, uh, you know, in good form in our hands than three months earlier and have it be full of errors and you know not a, as good of a design. We got a really good designer, uh, a local designer, in for this one. So the interior really looks great, and uh, the full cover came together nicely. So I'm very happy with it. Um, probably take a lot of time to list all the different wars in this book, I'm guessing, but do you guys want to just kind of cover a few of the different wars that the authors wrote about, yeah. or yeah. The, their background, I should say, for their story? Well, when we actually got together and started plotting what we wanted the guidelines, you know, first of all, we thought we don't want all stories going to be Vietnam or World War Two because we thought, you know, they're quite popular in fiction. So we said, you know, just from the whole range, past, present, future, just, you know, go wild. Uh, so we've got stories from ancient Rome. We've got um, the American Civil War. We've got a couple there. We have got a couple set in Vietnam as well. You know, just um, it's taking these horrors of war and um, the Cthulhu mythos just fitted in so well. The darkness of the war, the um, horrors, you know, it just fitted in perfectly. Um, I'm just thinking right now, yeah, we've got World War One story. Have we actually, did we have a World War Two story, Brian? I think we have a couple. Mm, we've got a couple set in Vietnam as well. Yes. Which I, and then uh, one we have the stories. What was that? One into the far future as well. One uh, a little bit of a sci-fi story that uh, yeah, yeah, we, we have uh, actually a couple, two stories that are set in the future. Maybe oh, yeah. two for Some sure. Story. Right. We have a story set in uh, actually I think two stories set in Troy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean everything you can imagine in between. Um, yeah. We Both really stories um, have a Trojan horse of sorts. Yes. Mm -hmm. They really do complement each other. Uh, we really did to... want to make sure that the authors were free to follow whatever path they wanted. Yeah. And uh, Glenn and I, we like variety in our books, so we got that. You say got you us, have uh, uh, just a on punk town story out of Jap too. So, sorry, what, Chris? I'm sorry. Uh, I was just saying they got us a, a new punk town story out of uh, Jeffrey Thomas, so that was a uh, nice well, that's little. Awesome. That's yeah. awesome, man. Love Jeffrey Thomas. Uh, just on a personal note, you did you say you have two um, World War Two stories in there? I, I like. I, that's, yes. Okay. Awesome. Who wrote those? Do you, if you remember off the top of your head. Uh, it's one really Michael. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other one is. What was that? Yeah, broadsword. Yeah. Um, yes. And. Yeah, Michael. Yeah. Here, let me. Ooh. Hey, hey, yeah. uh, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. My memory's horrible. Yeah. Oh, sorry. it's. Oh, uh, I can't remember a damn thing. <laughs> Old age. Uh, they're doing all these books, they start to ble bleed together. I think it was uh, Erdelak's uh, Boonie Man. Not really no, that's sure. Vietnam. That's Vietnam War, yeah. Hey, give me a sec. Uh, Morris's uh, Magna Matter is World War One, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, wait, because I just went through the you know went through the contents lately, and uh, I kind of remember some of these. No, wait, no. Is it? No, it's not yours. I think. Uh, is it, uh, Peter? Uh, is it yours? Cold War, Yellow Fever. Yeah, my, that's set in um, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, uh, we've got um, the Procyon Project by Tim Curran. That's okay. Actually, that's a World War Two veteran. Okay. One, so. Um, just Probably. as an aside, those that are. Usually... Hey, Glenn, is it a Feast of Death? Feast of Death. See, that's by oh my God. You see, this this is a problem when you have too many, you know, different stories. You don't remember who wrote what. <laughs> no, so we're okay. gonna go. How about we try yeah. this? For example? <laughs> right. everybody, if we ask everybody, and then they go by death. Feast of Death is the one actually set in the prison camp. Okay. Uh, okay. In is it India? I believe. Yeah. No. I was a, I was about to say, um, yeah. just as an aside, uh, Rick and Joe are usually in the show, and Google is being moody as usual. But and we're trying to get him in here. That's why I looked at him distracted. But finally got Joe in, so welcome, Joe. Thank you. Um, let me flip over to Pete. Uh, Pete, you want to talk a little bit about your story in World War Cthulhu? Sure. Um, my story takes place. Um, it's called uh, Cold War Yellow Fever. Mm -hmm. It's uh, set in and around the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it proposes that the Cuban Missile Crisis was not about nuclear weapons being pointed at the United States, but rather about the release of um, the King in Yellow as a result of CIA dirty tricks in Cuba. And that the fleet of the Soviets has been dispatched to put an end to the, the spread of the yellow fever. Um, and, of course, nobody really wants a nuclear weapon discharged 90 miles off the coast of the United States. They frown on it, yeah. Yeah. So uh, a, a small group of, of experts are sent in to uh, try and dis diffuse the whole situation before the Soviets decide to, to launch uh, their attack. And um, nothing goes well. Now, this is this is a very much a, a very much anticipated book, I know, and very popular already. However, I know that I want to clear up a small misconception. I think there were a couple of people out there that, at least, that thought it was like, okay, World War Cthulhu. This is about mankind against. Um, Cthulhu and Lovecraftian gods, and, th and that's not the theme of the book. You guys want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, we have some of that in this book. There are stories of man putting up the good fight against the forces of the mythos, but again, we wanted to explore all aspects of the mythos and human war and military and that kind of mindset. Yeah, so right. you'll find not the only theme of the book. Mm. Yeah, you will find stories where... Um, Mankind is like a spectator in what the mythos is doing, the Lovecraftian horror. Mm -hmm. You'll find stories where man begins to just barely discover some of the secrets, and of course, you give a monkey a you know a new stick, he's going to hit another monkey with it. So they try to manipulate that force for their own ends, and as we all know, that's never going to end well. Um, there's stories where the focus is on, you know, the hard and fast combat and a high action story. There's stories where it's more removed and you see, like, the after effect. Uh, there's stories where the war is in your face and there's stories where the war is just the setting. Uh, again, we really wanted to cover all sorts of warfare, both hot and cold, and all sorts of aspects of Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos. It's not, um, it's not like, say, an army of humans, army of deep ones, let's have it out. You know, there's a lot of... There's some overt war in there, but a lot of it, um, the mythos elements are in the shadows quite a bit, or doing dodgy deals with our governments. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's um, not it's not an all out war. You know, there are many character stories and uh, plots within the stories that aren't necessarily just giant battles for every story. I think that was a misconception as well that it was just going to be a bunch of guys <laughs> charging Cthulhu because that's one of the illustrations that we got produced, which was a great illustration by M. Wayne Miller. But um, but yeah, it's a lot of character study. It's a lot of interesting perspectives and different environments, and it's it's a very well very well varied <laughs> anthology. It's it's uh, well-rounded, I think. Yeah, I did want to bring that up because, as we all know, if, if man goes to war with those guys, they're they're not going to win. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Brian or Glenn, I think one of you guys or both have a copy of the book in front of you. Would you mind quickly reading the, down the list of authors that contributed to the book? Okay. So, Let's see, Brian. Right here. Okay, we've got John Shirley with the lead-off story, followed by Stephen Mark Rainey, T.E. Grau, William Pugmire, Robert M. Price, Ed Erdelak, Neil Baker, wave, Neil. That was me. That's Neil. Uh, David Conyers and David Kernot combined to do a story. Willem Meikle is it Meikle or Michael? Meikle, is Meikle. 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 Yeah. He's in here. The guy's been in like almost every one of my books. I still can't pronounce his name correctly. I'm sorry, Will. <laughs> uh, Charles Christian, Josh Reynolds, L. Lee Clark Zumpy, Christine Morgan, Constantine. You're gonna have to help me with that last name. Clarence. Thank you. <laughs> what he said. Uh, Cody Goodfellow. This one is very important to me. C.J. Henderson. Oh, yeah. This, this was one of his last stories. This was his last story he sent to me. And I'm happy to announce that World War Cthulhu is dedicated to the memory of C.J. He was a, a good friend of mine. And he was a great author and just a great guy. And he's gone from us way too soon. Yeah, we did a we did a show commemorating him a few weeks back. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, um Edward Morris. Uh Glenn and I did a tag team on a story. Mm-hmm. Doc we Cell. Got, yep. We got uh Pete Rollick. Say Pete hi. The hack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But his checks keep clearing, so I keep putting them in my books. <laughs> oh, is that how it works? <laughs> uh, Daryl Schweitzer, Tim Curran, and Jeffrey Thomas. Jeffrey so did a punk down story? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That has a whole heaping lot of authors in this book. And just check out, this is a, this is a big, fat book. Um, no, I, I got I to gotta say something here, because... Yeah. People may um, balk at the money for the limited edition with the color illustrations. But you know what? Um, Centipede Press put out a book of Lovecraftian art a few years ago. A limited number of copies, and they were grossly expensive. Mm -hmm. But that's only money. And ten years from now, you'll still have the book. Yeah. And these illustrations, I posted some of them to the Easing website. Uh, that were available online, they're magnificent. I mean, for the art alone, you should be getting the book. You know, it's not, it's not just the stories. Of course, I can't wait to get it in my hands, but gosh, these illustrations are gorgeous. We How will get many of those them. limited editions do you have with the illustrations, color illustrations? There are two different limited editions. There's the basic uh, signed and numbered, and then there's the, the deluxe slipcase edition, which is the lettered edition. And uh, we did have to charge a little bit more just because of the color printing. Um, but I'm trying to see if we can get them printed offset. The problem is, is that offset printers have a certain minimum print run, and we have these campaign exclusive editions that is going to be a smaller amount than the retail print runs. The campaign exclusive editions have three... Uh, bonus interior illustrations. So they have 25 color interior illustrations total, 
and um, they also have all the Indiegogo backers listed in the back of the book as sort of thanks, you know, kind of awesome. giving them all recognition. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we have to do two different print runs on these, and, uh, you know, offset full-color printing with 25-color interior illustrations is not inexpensive, unfortunately, and it's when you count in shipping and everything else, you know, there's just a certain point where you have to try to make some kind of profit for your business, but you don't want to completely overcharge the customer. But Well, color printing is expensive. Yeah. All those so we're printing. trying to get these so offset. The, uh, limited, the limited deluxe edition with the 22 illustrations, what would they pay? What would they pay? Um, what do you mean Price for the thing. printing? No, what if when you when you put it on sale, what is it going to go for? Oh, the uh, there's a basic limited for uh, sixty dollars, and then there's the deluxe slipcase, which is signed by both editors, uh, both artists, and multiple authors, which will go for two hundred. And it's going to have this custom Cthulhu stamp on the front book board and on the slipcase. It's going to be a really nice, and it's going to have Vincent Chong's original color cover artwork as end sheets, uh, fully illustrated end sheets, and um, yeah, it's really going to come together nice, but I just don't uh, like. It sounds like a lot of money, but but it's not really, not right. for what you're getting, and not for the fact that you'll have like a really collectible heirloom piece. Yeah, yeah. And while we're on the subject of price, I believe the regular edition is going to be what fifteen ninety five. Do I remember that right? Yeah, fifteen ninety five. Um, and uh, ebook's going to be five ninety nine. I think four ninety nine. Okay. Uh, and both of those will be available. We have the black and white trade paperback available, um, but the color is causing a little bit longer production time. So, uh, but those should be in stock by next month. So, uh, the regular edition and the Kindle edition, those will both be available Tuesday. Do I have that right? Yeah, Tuesday, um, August nineteenth. They will both uh, be available. Uh, it'll be available on our website and on Amazon. Of course, we prefer people to go to our website, but right. uh, it, it will be on Amazon as well. And the ebook will be on the Amazon Kindle exclusively, at least for now. We might put it on other platforms in the future. But um, yeah, and both are black and white. We sent all of the Indiegogo backers the full color ebook editions already, just so they had a little uh, advanced reading opportunity. But um, yeah, the color physical editions. Uh, will be in stock next month. So, um, well, for everybody watching live right now, like I said, stay tuned. We're going to give away uh, the one of the deluxe ones, I guess you'd say, and two print uh, copies of the of the regular edition uh, later on in the show. So, um, I have that right, don't I, Chris? Uh, originally, well, I mean, why don't we just, we can't just cheap out now, we have to go for the deluxe, but I was going to go for the Cthulhu bundle originally. That's, the, uh, that's what I said originally, the Cthulhu bundle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. Uh, and then two of the regular. Work product. Product. That's fine. Yeah. Be generous, that's fine. No, no, I wasn't trying to give away your product. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, Cthulhu bundle's better than what I got. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'll give you I don't got nothing yet. Neil, you want to talk about your story real quick? Um, sure. It's it's more of an intimate story. It's it's really about one man um, on a mission um, to uh, to sink the British, mm -hmm. um, and it's based on a true story uh, about the first submersible, which was nicknamed the Turtle. It was invented by a guy called Bushnell with help from Ben Franklin, and I just I, I just saw an opportunity to make a a, a, a claustrophobic tale. Um, but at the same time, get some nice uh, Dagon type elements into my story because I'm all over the Dagon stuff. Um, so I think people will, will enjoy it because it is, like I said, it's, it's one man against uh, against the baddies, and uh, there's, a, there's some nice monsters in there. And I had a lot of fun writing it. I just actually just want, want to mention just quickly that uh, it's a shame yeah. that um, M. Wayne Miller isn't here. Yeah. With us, you know, because I'd love to. Talk to him about his process because I was so blown away by the illustration he did for my story as well as everybody else's stories. But it's just extraordinary. I, I can't believe what he did there. Yeah, you know, it's a pretty neat feeling when you write a story and an artist reads it and you know paints or draws their interpretation of that. That's a nice feeling. 
Absolutely. Well, as, as Brian would attest, I, I, I illustrated it myself. I, I did a, a, a cheesy little uh, painting of it, and I, and I thought it was pretty cool, but then I saw what M. Wayne did, and I went, oh, okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he nailed it. <laughs> so he, he got inside my head better than I did. Yeah, this was some of Wayne's best work, and we've been working with Wayne for probably a couple decades now. So, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with what he did here. I, I was blown away by it. Every time I've posted one of those pictures, you know, promoting the book for you guys, people just go crazy over the artwork. It's yeah. really yeah. good stuff. We uh, really um, we're really lucky as in we got to see this artwork as it came in. We saw his like preliminary sketches. So we were getting two of these pieces of wonderful art every week, sometimes three pieces of art. And it was absolutely awesome. You know, we were just really wanted to share it with people, but we had to keep it to ourselves for a while. Um, like the one, the illustration of Christine Morgan's story, for example, just absolutely beautiful. They all are. Um, I'll comment on that because yeah, I, I've seen a lot of the other uh, artwork, and it shows up. There's a lot of monsters in this book, and. Mm -hmm when Wayne Miller did my piece, it's very subdued. It's very subtle. And I really appreciate that because the story is all about this whole creeping effect. And the way that Miller did that in, in, my piece, in his artwork for my piece is just, it blew me away that he was able to capture what I was doing in text, in art. And it's it's one of, gotta be one of the favorite pieces I've ever seen illustrated for my work. Well, uh, for mine, he had explosions in it, and it was awesome. <laughs> it was the first time you know someone actually made an illustration that was worth it. <laughs> I remember thinking, I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna make a t-shirt. I'm gonna make my friends wear the t-shirt. And that's that's the power of crowdfunding right there too. Is like what what is cooler than a bunch of people getting together with their enthusiasm behind a project to expand it beyond its original scope and add a bunch of cool artwork to it? You know that that wouldn't have really been possible. I mean, theoretically, you could do it with a regular pre-order on your website, but there's something about crowdfunding that really kind of gets everybody together and for a single unifying purpose, which is expanding the project to something bigger and better. So uh, we got we got there pretty good, I think. So. And also, we were able to expand the scope of the book by three different stories, three more stories, just because of how successful the Indiegogo was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I it remember. Was actually, yeah, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it was one of the uh, the most successful campaigns for a book on Indiegogo in its history. I know that it was one of the top three. I think we got second place for most funders ever in an Indiegogo for a book. Uh, so we did pretty well. Yeah, we were at um, the Portland uh, HP Lovecraft Film Festival together, Chris. And yes. I remember we were, we were. I think we were both on our phones checking to see what was going on. <laughs> every every half hour, we were like, "Did you did you see? Did you see?" It's, it's yeah, so, I remember that. Yeah. It's so exciting to watch this stuff happen and realize yeah. that your expectations for what you were going to be able to do have ch suddenly changed. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, to see that happen in real time and, and know that what those contributions are doing for you, that's crazy. That's something we've never had had before. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something where uh, I really do think if done right and not overdone, it could be part of a business model. I think that it's just a more powerful way to pre-order a product. It's essentially putting a pre-order on a third-party website with a time limit and a more professional presentation and a video. and it, It's just basically a one-page uh, selling letter and then with a good presentation. And if they want to get behind it, they place a pre-order. And we did it for retail price. We weren't doing $10 virtual high fives. It was $15 for a trade paperback, $50 for a signed hardcover. So it's... I think it's just a more powerful way to do a pre-order, honestly. I, uh, I think that, especially for a project like this. I mean, there's, you can do overboard. You can go too many campaigns, too much stuff. But for a project like this, it really warrants it, I think, because there's so much room for expansion, you know. 
So. Yeah, I thought the same thing. Uh, definitely a new way of doing things and a good way of doing things. So. Uh, still controversial though. People are still kind of uh, torn about it. You know, some people are like, "Oh, it's it's virtual panhandling," and I'm like, "So I could launch this book on my website with an add to cart button and say that'll be in stock in six months and nobody will throw a fuss. But if it's on a third party website with a time limit." And it has a back this campaign button. All of a sudden, it's highly controversial. You know, I yeah. I just I, I've been in several <laughs> debates with these people, but I just I feel strongly that it's uh, if well utilized and you're not ripping anybody off. I mean, who loses in this equation? You know? well, well, my question so, is like, where, where do you get the money, the seed money, to get the book going if you don't do something like this these days? Money's tight for everybody, and this gives yeah. you the money you need to actually commission the authors and the artwork. And then take your time with the the, the layout. You know, um, my comment on that yeah, was that with these saying. people that are um, what these people that are against that don't realize is that places like Indiegogo and Kickstarter are making it possible for the small press to bring us books like this. And if it wasn't for, for example, in this case, Indiegogo, I mean, your only choices out there would be these big publishers. They're not push, publishing Lovecraftian fiction and weird fiction, you know. So this is a benefit to the consumer. I mean, it's not. It's a good thing, you know. And if 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 you guys couldn't make money that way, it quite possibly wouldn't exist. Yeah, if we had to do it just a regular pre-order on our website. Well, also. Yeah, there was just it, a regular pre-order website. It would not have been the the book that it is today. Basically, it would have would have not been as successful. It wouldn't have been able to get all these extra illustrations. We would have just done it as a standard, you know, thing. And uh, so, yeah, it would be nowhere near as big or as beautiful. And that's mm -hmm. why I am very thankful for the uh, crowdsourcing. It the book would have came out, but it would not be as the book we have now. Yeah, yeah. and you know. Matt and I both, as Matt and I are big collectors, and Matt and I both know that there are a couple companies out there who will put a book up for pre-order, and it won't come out for years. <laughs> Cemetery dance. <laughs> I didn't say anything. That's on you. Oh, I was just about to cough too. Jeez. <laughs> you know, and, you know. So basically, they're sitting there waiting until they get enough pre-orders and enough interest in the book to. And it's not just that company. There's a couple of them. And Matt and I both know that there was one that went out of business holding people's money. Yeah. And yeah, but, uh, you know, they, they, I'm sure it doesn't happen often. Yeah. Well, but, but the point here, and I think the point that Chris is making, is that by doing it through Indiegogo or Kickstarter or whatever, you're, you're setting out a, this is a time limit we're going to do, this is the funds we need, and here's what we're going to deliver. And if we don't deliver on time or within a reasonable amount of time, you can start calling us on it. Right. You've set a timeline, as opposed to some of the other companies who's like, well, okay, for example, I just got a book we ordered three years ago. <laughs> it just got in the mail this week. Was that uh, Lucifer's Lottery? No, uh, but, you know, <laughs> but you, you know what I'm talking about. So, Absolutely. But here... We closed up this Kickstarter just a couple months ago. What, six months ago now? And yeah, the book's coming March. out. Yeah, you know, Pete, I've got a book on my shelf that very few were sold, and then the it, it, was, it was on Amazon for about a day and then off Amazon, and it, it still hasn't come out. Yeah. You know, something like this really would have benefited it. You yep. know? Yep. So... Yeah, I you know it's I really try to avoid. I mean, once we even get to like the six month mark, I start feeling kind of not too good about it. You know, it, no way I could ever go past a year. I mean, we can we can get something out within six months if we're really just constantly just on top of it. But Wayne had so many illustrations to do was one thing. I mean, it had he had nineteen extra illustrations to create, and that's just not a you can just do three a day or something. You know, it's like a gradual process. So. And then we had to, you know, proof and edit the extra stories and, and really design the whole package. And um, But, yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be uh, too upset about a few extra months once they get the book in their hands because it looks fantastic. So no, yeah. The other thing about this kind of system is 
how do you promote people to write in your genre? They've got to make a living. They've got to get paid. And the major companies aren't giving you paying births for, for these stories. Right. It's like if you want if we want our favorite authors to produce, you know, good stuff and not a lot of the self published dross that comes out, somehow we've got to get the funds to do it. And that's just gotta come from somewhere. I that's one reason I really like this. I can think of like a half a dozen books that have been crowdfunded now, including a beautiful new Delta Green book that came out a year or so ago. You know, that wouldn't have happened without this the system. I've got a couple of comments from people watching right now. Um, Nathan says, most of the people who are complaining about that kind of funding approach would find fault in almost anything you do. And A.D. Borman makes a, an extremely good point. He says, crowdfunding is the ultimate in freedom of choice. I can use my money to support projects that I believe in. The alternative is corporate market research, mass market play by whatever <laughs> play by means. But I know what he means, you know? Yeah. There's yeah. a lot more choices for the, for the readers. Yeah, it, but it's, gives, it's like also a market test. It gives the power to the crowd and the consumers, and it's all about yeah. open information. It's not to – you don't need to go to a an elite to get some kind of loan or, like, funds or investors. You let the people decide where – and the, in the end, going to be your consumers anyway. So it's essentially a market test, and now we know World War Cthulhu will sell well retail because of how successful the campaign was. So it, it really tests the validity of an idea – and it helps, uh, you know, fully fund it without being indebted to any kind of strange elite people that have paws in your business. It's just consumers that are excited and want to help you get started. And it's, yeah, it's it's much more powerful, I think. And I'm just checking the World War Cthulhu page now. We have over a thousand likes officially on that, so that's uh, that's good. We were stuck at 90, 986 for about a week, and it was driving me insane. So <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm that's awesome. Good. Yeah. Popular support. It's it's about what the people want, you know. Um, like I said, we're gonna Chris and the guys are give, gonna give away. We're gonna get randomly give away three copies of the book here a little bit later. Um, Chris and Brian, do you guys want to? Chris, you want to briefly talk about uh, Dark Regions Press, and then I think uh, you have an announcement about, about Brian too that you might wanted to let everybody know about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, DRP has been around for a long time. My dad, Joe Mori, started it uh, in 85, although it's kind of hazy between 84 and 86, but we just say 85. Um, so the same year I was born, basically. So, you know, he gave, like, you know, only half the amount of attention he would to me otherwise. But no, I'm just kidding. He was a great dad. Wait a second. You were born in 85? Um, yeah, I was born in 85, yeah. And, uh, I had kids by then. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, but yeah, so uh, I got involved in 2006 with doing the website stuff and internet marketing, mm -hmm. and then um, I got more and more involved with that, and eventually he just handed the whole press to me in August of 2012, and so I've been just running with it since then. Um, but yeah, and we have expanded significantly over the past two years. Like, last summer was far different than this summer, for example. I mean, we've published... Uh, Clyde Barker's The Midnight Me Train Special Definitive Edition were published new in novella by Joe Lansdale and um, yeah we have World War Cthulhu and some other big projects coming another Joe Lansdale novella later this year um, we are like a specialty press we, we have a niche in signed hardcover editions um, but we also do trade paperbacks and ebooks um, and ever expanding distribution model that we're working on um, and uh, yeah, we have a few new lines. There's so much to talk about. I could just go through this for for hours, but I'll try to summarize it quickly. Um, the we kind of split up the business into these different lines, where it's we have Dark Regions Horror, Dark Regions Fantasy, Dark Regions Sci-Fi, headed up by R.J. Cavender, uh, Emily Gable, and uh, Michael Bailey, who's a very talented editor that's working on a new sci-fi horror anthology with a Stephen King story, and I can never pronounce the title of this anthology. It's a, it's a sci-fi horror anthology, but yeah, check out Michael Bailey's stuff. <clears throat> but so we recently announced that uh, we are launching another line, uh, which is Dark Regions Weird Fiction, which has a focus on, obviously, weird fiction, Lovecraftian horror, cosmic horror, 
and that will be headed by none other than Brian Sammons, who will be the managing editor and be working on projects within the line. And the thing about these lines is that they are all original uh, uh, projects. So nothing but original fiction, all unpublished material. So I, my goal for these lines is to put out nothing but new content that nobody has experienced before, just new stories, interesting stories. There's enough people doing, you know, 500 Stephen King collectible editions, you know, I like I want to try to com put more original creative content out there and and uh, I trust Brian's editing ability. He's already got some cool projects underway and uh, I couldn't be more pleased with it. But you told me before was that since you were heading, you needed somebody for the weird fiction, you were looking for someone weird. I think those were your exact words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I deemed Brian the most weird of all the people I knew, so he didn't fire up on the spot. And, no, it was uh, his clear knowledge of Lovecrafting horror and, and all the great, it was a huge, hugely uh, right. great experience and a pleasure to work on World War Cthulhu with him and Glenn and, and all the authors and uh it was just so positive all around. It just made sense. It just kind of, it just kind of fell into place naturally. So, Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about what you want to accomplish in that, in the weird fiction line at Dark yeah. Reasons? Thanks. Um, first, let me say I am beyond excited to be working with uh, Chris and DRP. Uh, I went to DRP because I knew that they made amazingly beautiful books, and I wanted one. Damn it, I wanted one with my name on it. And uh, the experience was so good on our end. Uh, I've worked with a few publishers now, and there's a lot of good ones. There's a lot that aren't. And That's it's true. nice to have people who have your back, who are there for you, who support you, and get where you're going. And uh, Chris was one of them. So when we started talking about the weird fiction line, and he's like, hey, you want to run it? I'm like, well, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're going to do <coughs> weird fiction in all its forms. It's going to be more than just Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos, however, that's certainly going to be a part of it. Uh, I'm a fan of all flavors of weird fiction. And uh, we're going to do more than just anthologies, although they are still going to remain a, a vital part of our line. Mm -hmm. I want to do weird fiction novels. And more specifically more uh, to my uh, way of, my personal taste, I want to do a line of novellas. I love the novella format, and a lot of publishers overlook it. And I do not want to be one of them. I, I think it's becoming more popular with readers these days, too. Well, it is. It's, it's, it's a good chunk. It's a good, meaty story, but it's not the investment of a, like an entire novel. Right. But it is far more filling than a short story. And uh, a lot of publishers don't know what to do with those weird-sized stories. Used to um, get ace doubles. What's that? Used to get ace doubles. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I want to have a be... line of... Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to interject that World of Cthulhu is number one in Brian's weird fiction line. So that was another announcement, is that it's sort of... That's the... why it's got the number one on the side. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Make it that much more collectible, you know, make it that much more of a gem. And, uh, yeah, we have, um, uh, we're initiating each line of fiction with a an illustrated anthology. And we have another Indigo campaign, believe it or not, starting next month for Dark Regions Horror Number 1, which is another illustrated anthology that's been, um, uh, R.J. Cavender is helping edit it, and it was edited by uh, Benjamin Kane Atheridge and uh, Brad C. Hodson. Um, and that's going to be another beautiful anthology, so... Here we go again, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of coffee on hand and go back to it. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, it sounds like you did really, the Indiegogo did really well by, uh, you like that better than Kickstarter, I take it. I, I think so because, um, for one, you can have flexible funding, which means if you happen not to hit your goal, you can still get, I mean, if you get 20,000 of 25,000, you can still get those funds to, you know, secure part of the project. But right. also because they can choose to pay via PayPal, and those payments come through while the campaign is running. Um, thus, you can pay contributors and other people involved in the project. Um, and Really? You know, I didn't know that there was a, that was a difference there. That's pretty key. A lot of people really prefer to pay with PayPal. Yeah, yeah, it's a big difference. Uh, Kickstarter actually works through Amazon Payments, which is kind of awkward and weird. Um, I, I really like uh, uh, PayPal's simplicity. It's just, you know, here's the amount, click, click, 
sent. So it's uh, and and getting those funds while the campaign is running also helps a lot with you know paying Wayne for these extra illustrations, for example, that are when we're unlocking the stretch goal, so we can get started immediately without having to wait till two weeks after the campaign is over to get all the funds gathered in one spot. But um, so yeah, it's uh, I would recommend Indiegogo actually over Kickstarter, although Kickstarter still has more traffic, I think, and is a bit more popular. Um, but I think that's I think slowly. How you market it too, you know, that's that's key, you know. Yeah, it's all about a successful crowdfunding campaign is all about a good idea, a professional presentation, and proper outreach. And if you have those three things, then you are very well on your track to success. As long as you don't start slacking off or making a bunch of mistakes. So. Yeah, I ask because my my uh, I'm going to be publishing an anthology of original. Lovecraftian stories called Autumn Cthulhu. I'm gonna fund it, you know, much the same way you guys did. And uh, yeah, I I think Indiegogo is the way to go too. So sounds like there's some. Yeah. But I really like the PayPal thing. That's that's a big that's key. That's a big one. Yeah, if you're paying, if you're getting an artist in there or something, and you have some extra costs that come up during the campaign, or you want to get the project on a head start. Yeah. That's pretty key. Uh, Pete, do you have a question for Glenn? Yeah. So Glenn. Yep. Um. We've worked together on a lot of books now, mm -hmm. more than I'd like to think about. And um, there's a scene in Flash Gordon where Flash Gordon is fighting Baron, mm -hmm. the tilting platform with the spikes coming out, and they're tied together. Yeah. So can you talk about the creative process between you and Brian on choosing stories. Is it like that, or? Um. <laughs> okay. To be honest, um, should I feel this? Go for it. We've Go for been it. we've been very lucky, really, that we have such similar tastes in fiction. That there hasn't really been many battles over which stories we want in the book. We quite often we have like a yes, a no, and a maybe folder. Um, generally, we we usually have a good percentage of the same stories in the yes folder. Um, you know, we weigh the pros and cons with the story. Because, say for example, we don't want a story, two stories, three, four stories of the same theme, so that becomes repetitive, you know. So, as Brian has actually said earlier, we, you know, originality, you know, nothing repetitive. Um, but, yeah, we've, in, I don't know how many books we've actually done together so far, but there haven't been any major arguments about what we have in the book. Okay. No point yet. You know, um, Brian I got, and I went head to head, and you know there were fists thrown and curses. <laughs> I got a couple questions from some live viewers. Uh, first question from Michael Simpson, probably more for Chris, but uh, will DRP be using slash exploring sword and sorcery, uh, Howard style horror, or is it modern slash contemporary horror only? Um. So, sword and sorcery slash dark fantasy was the question, or yeah, what was I think the... he's asking if you're going to be doing that in the future, any of that. Um, <clears throat> well, I'd say the sword and sorcery has a has a chance of showing up in the fantasy line at some point. I originally the plan for the fantasy line was to make it dark fantasy only, but I've sort of shifted to allow it to encompass all of the genre of fantasy, just because it opens us up to that market, and plus, you know. Not necessarily everything has to be dark. I know the world is all hatred and despair, but we can have a little bit of other stuff on the side too, you know. But it uh, same with the side. Uh, yeah, I really really my, my Christmas Cthulhu anthology. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's something where it's it's I, you know it. I understand that the inclination for Dark Regions Press to have the the dark orientation for our lines, but same mm -hmm. with the sci-fi line. It, it's open to all. Uh, Subgenres of science fiction. It's not just horror sci-fi as I originally planned, but so yeah, sword and sorcery could be in the future. So I think I'm I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question. Uh, but just to cover my bases, uh, Mark on Twitter said, "Great show, very interesting." Will War of Cthulhu two be all new original stories too? And I'd like to add to that: Is there anything else you can tell us about War of Cthulhu two? I know there's some things you can't say right now. Yeah, tell us about World War Cthulhu two because I don't. <laughs> Yeah. No, cat's out of the bag for Pete. We have. Hey, I, it wasn't me. It was Brian. So. Well, somebody else. Uh, Chris is the one who first dropped that bomb, so he can take this question. <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll blame Chris. Uh, we are. Uh, I can say that it will be all original 
um, stories. I will say that much. I won't reveal the concept or how we're structuring this one um, or the extra features because that's sort of a exclusive an exclusive reveal for the people who buy the World War Cthulhu bundle package thing on the pre-order page on our website. So we're sort of doing a little exclusive reveal for now, but then later in the year we'll actually say, hey, everybody, this is what we're doing with the next one. But, uh, you know, I think with everything we learn, we're going to build on a pretty strong foundation, and it should be, I wouldn't imagine it being any less successful, especially with, I think we have a strong concept for it, too. So I think everybody would be pretty pleased. But Okay, I, I do have a few more questions here from live viewers. We've got a lot of people watching. Uh, First of all, a comment from Jeanette. I uh, just want to say I look forward to Tuesday, and the illustrations are gorgeous. Um, Christopher Yost asks, he's got two questions. First question is, how many authors were originally approached for the project? I don't know if you actually did it quite that way, though, Brian and Glenn, but if you want to comment on that, you can. Oh, hell, I can't remember. Uh, a bunch. Um, yeah. The way Glenn and I do anthologies is we usually invite everybody we know who's a good writer, who will work for the project, who will fit in, and then uh, we say, this is what we're looking for, and a woman win. So uh, we read a lot of stories for this. Unfortunately, a lot of good ones had to be rejected just for space. Uh, again, because of this Indiegogo, because we're able to expand upon and we were able to put in three excellent stories that were were killing us to cut. So, yeah, because That's of so that tough. extra money, oh, it's it's horrible when you when you put a book together. There's always good stories you just can't use because you run out of space. Um, yeah, this was one it's of those a... happy instances where we could we could incorporate a few more. Go ahead, Glenn. Brian, if you remember, I was absolutely rooting for um, the Yoth protocols. In fact, someone just posted about that on Facebook earlier. That story was brilliant. I was so happy. I mean, we got three stretch goal stories in the end. We got Long Island Weird, Yoth protocols, and um, was the third one again? Um, I'll just Don't mind me you. looking about again. Yeah. Well, you know, this is a good opportunity. I, I do have a couple more questions from people, uh, but I want to point out to all you writers watching uh, right now or in the future, you know, if your story gets rejected from a magazine or an anthology, it's not always because it was terrible. It could be a great story that just they ran out of room, or maybe they've already got two stories that are similar in theme to yours, and, and that's the reason why they can't take yours, you know. Or... So, but yeah. but you should always send an angry email to the editor. Always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think your mother it. loved it. Because personally, as an editor, I can tell you I, I love it when I get yelled at. So, you know, I, I immediately ask what else they have to submit. So. Well, and also sometimes it's a great story, but it just doesn't fit the theme of the book. Yeah. Um, right. For this book here, an author sent me a story that was excellent, sent us a story, and it just wasn't right for it. But it was perfect for an upcoming book that I was doing. That book happened to eventually become Dark Rites of Cthulhu by April Moon Books. And uh, so as soon as that other book started up, I'm like, hey, remember that story you sent me? It didn't work here, but it's per perfect for this. Per so perfect. Per so if um, you get a rejection, yeah, it could just be a, no matter how Good the story was, it just wasn't right for the book. Uh, I suspect one of the stories uh, that didn't get in is actually going to be in one of my books coming out soon as well, because it, it feels like it belongs in World War Cthulhu. <laughs> so, so we'll see. I'll talk to Adam you Adam Bassett says uh, the book sounds amazing. I can't get. Uh, excuse me. I can't wait to get a copy in my hands. Even a normal print sounds intriguing. The idea of mixing real world war situations tinted with some Lovecraftian goodness just makes me smile. And then I've got a question up here if I can find... Oh, Christopher Yost says again, Brian, nice Cthulhu on your shelf. Mine is looking over my shoulder right now. Um, <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll briefly touch do. on this one if you guys want to, because I know a lot of people that watch this later and, and now probably are, are writers. 
Uh, Kimberly says, do you guys have any advice for first-time authors looking to get published by Dark Regions Press? So, uh, Well, the, the best story. scenario for a first-time author is to submit to one of our new lines, which is Dark Regions Horror, Fantasy, Sci-Fi, and now Weird Fiction. Um, the submission guidelines on our website are you know, pretty much completely up to date, so if you go to our website at the very top it says submit, you click on that link and then, then there are the instructions for the three different lines and although we don't have the uh, the specific guideline description for the weird fiction line up on the submit page yet because we, we just announced that, but <clears throat> that'll, well I don't know if we're gonna do I haven't fully discussed that with Brian to be honest about the open submissions possibilities for the line, it is going through the slush piles of manuscripts sometimes can be pretty exhausting um, but that's I, that's Brian's decision I think if he wants to do that we're gonna get volunteers we have people who work at uh, or internships um, that help us with the manuscript reading they are interns at Portland State University which is uh, one of the bigger schools here in the Portland area and they've been helping a lot with going through manuscripts and just sort of saying this one's high potential, the editor should really read this one, this one doesn't even follow the guidelines, and sort of helps sort of filter through the different piles and piles of submissions that we get. Cause, but that, that's the best uh, chance. If you contact one of our guys directly, it's, it's, uh, it's better to go through the process, I would say. Um, so just click on the submit link on the top of our website, darkreads.com, and it's all right there. So. Uh, Glenn says... Uh... No double spacing after a sentence. Glenn, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do that too. It's, that's a hard habit to unlearn, you know. Two people do, they just can't get well, out of it. Does this have to come from comfort level? <laughs> two spaces after a period. But, train. At least I only use, at the most, three exclamation points after the end of the sentence. Mm. <laughs> well, someone else bought them all up. Well, there is a world shortage of exclamation points right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, let me see okay. if I have more questions. Anything else you guys want to say about World of Cthulhu that I haven't thought to ask? Or? Yeah. Is, is are you still going ahead with the uh, the audio book? Yeah. Good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are, and we are in the process of figuring out because um, the thing is, is that the production costs turned out to be so significant that we've had to set aside a little bit of money for the audio book, and are going to have to make up. Uh, for the cost of the audiobook with the extra funds raised from the pre-order on Tuesday. But, um, yeah, it's going to be, you know, narrators don't come cheap, and we actually got a good deal with the person who's interested in working with us. So, um, but, yeah, we're still Is very much doing the audiobook. It's just going to, what's that? Is that going to go through Audible, Chris? Um, yeah, we will post it on Audible, um, and we're still sort of navigating into the audiobook realm. DRP never did audiobooks, and so it's a learning process for me as well, but... Um, you know, if you look at ebook and audiobook sales, they're pretty much exactly in tandem, going up. And uh, while print, uh, at least in paperback, mass paperback, steadily declines, but that's to be expected in a certain respect. But um, yeah, so we'll definitely have the audiobook up by the end of the year on uh, on Audible. But well, you, you know, the nice thing about Audible and audiobooks and ebooks is. You're in the mood for this book right now. You see it. You click on it. You can be reading it or listening to it. You know, a minute or two later. You know, that's true. that's pretty important for some people. That's true. Yeah, and uh, I think that um, the mass paperback will eventually go away. I think it'll be a a red box, you know, print on demand machine essentially for trade paperback books, and then there'll be a, a yearning for the specialty hardcover. I think there will be another resurgence of the specialty book in the coming 10, 20 years when people yearn for the quality physical materials when everything's gone digital and kids are growing up with iPads in kindergarten. So, yeah. So uh, there's one uh, question I'd like to ask about the audiobook. So now that we know that Ice-T is doing D&D books, okay, <laughs> and he's reading fiction books, what are the chances that we might get him to do a full voiceover of World War Cthulhu? <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances? Like Ice-T right here. Um, I would love to. My guys, I don't know. I've got a couple guys over there that might be able to help out. Huh? <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Let's rephrase the question. One of you gets to have I see read his story. Which one would it be and why? <laughs> why do you think you are the best for I see to read your story? <laughs> I guess I do have another couple questions from the audience. Uh, <laughs> 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 
Sorry, I, I'm trying to do two things at once here. Sorry. Alex Krieger says, I'm not sure if I understand this question. I'll read it. While every perspective on the mythos is valid, uh, are there any particularly suggestive slash suspenseful works in the flavor of Lovecraft's stated ideal of weird fiction as illustrated in The Color Out of Space? I, I don't know what that means. Anybody know what that means? Yeah, it seems more like a statement. Mm. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Alex. Might have to reword that. Uh, Nathan wants to know if there's any stories in the books that would lend themselves to the best short film. Yeah, the toe. Sorry? <laughs> like Neil said, the turtle. Oh, okay. Because yeah. mm. uh, I, I would say that. An iced tea could narrate the turtle, too. Will Wheaton. I was just listening to um, the, the voiceover he did for Eternal Lies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, a friend of mine did the, the music for Eternal Lies, the RPG, and Will does an amazing job on that. So yeah, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be a good one to get. But yeah, yeah I got uh, animating <laughs> a couple of shorts. Do you know what the thing is with these voiceovers? Well, if we can't get iced tea, well, vanilla ice, if the stretch gold doesn't reach Hey, you know, he's not that, he doesn't live that far away from me. Really? Yeah. He does you a think lot of you can get him, you know, have him read something from us, but, you know, we have to uh, read all difficult names because he was kind of in trouble with them. <laughs> he, um, <laughs> he goes to a car show in, in the the, uh, the restaurant right around the corner from my house. No, it's Pimp My ID. That. Yeah. That wasn't iced tea. No, that wasn't. Uh, iced teas and uh, Laura no. Vanilla ice. Mm. Oh. oh, my God. What? Vanilla ice? Vanilla ice. Hey Rick, I think your speakers are doing something weird. Can you hit your mute button? Yeah, like chipmunks. I think it's intentional. I think we're listening in to uh, something horrible, and our ears can interpret it. Oh God! <laughs> oh my God! They yeah, you, you sound really strange. Alien message is gonna be. <laughs> oh my God! This is frightening. I Rick, I actually think that's Rick's voice. How it sounds naturally. Rick is turned tuned into the Conet project. It seems. <laughs> Rick, can you hit your mute button and then we'll work it out in a minute. We'll figure it out. I think I know what to do in a bit. Hey, Joe. Hey. Sorry, Google's being moody. Oh boy. Um. I, I, I tried to connect. Well, after rebooting three times, I've tried to connect hmm. at least 20 times in, in the last hour and 10 minutes. Well, before we do this giveaway, do we have anything else to say about what we're through, though, guys? Did I miss anything? Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, they should be at darkregions.com to pick up a copy of this book. And we have a very special offering on that page that has a signed artwork print from M. Wayne, M. Wayne Miller, the artist that did all those beautiful illustrations for the book. Um, and it also has the signed hardcover editions in full color and a T-shirt and a lot of other cool stuff. So they should definitely be there on Tuesday at darkregions.com. That's not like a commercial. It's darkregions.com, right? Not darkregionspress.com? I have that That's right. right. Yeah, dark .com. We, I believe, still own the domain, but I believe it just forwards to our website, or it should. Okay. All right, so Tuesday, um, go to uh, darkregions.com. You can order the book. Uh, if you forget that, and all you remember is Lovecraft Easy, I'll have a, uh, I'll have a, on the left side banner on every page on the site, I'll have a, a link to it. So you can, you can click on that, and it'll take you right to the order page, too. Alex has reworded his question on Facebook. Pardon me. Oh. Uh, okay. He says, uh, I apologize. What I'm asking is if, what I'm asking if there are any works in the anthology that avoid overt scares or descriptions of the horrors. Uh, I'd say definitely yes. A lot of them are subtle. Yes. So. I, I, I've tried to be subtle this time. I so, tried. Yeah, I, that's One a... That comes that's a good idea. One that comes easily to my mind would be C.J. Henderson's story. It is a very somber, moody piece. 
uh, no tentacles, no, you know, any of the other, what a lot of people just think is, you know, Cthulhu stuff. It is, a, uh, but it is nonetheless very terrifying. It is a very dark and disturbing piece, but it's not in your face, it's not overt. And that's just one that immediately jumped to mind. Yeah. Oh, I know there's much more than that. Um, oh, yeah. Here's what we're going to do. Um, I, Joe and Rick and Pete, I think we're all, we're going to stick around and talk about a few other Lovecraftian subjects for anybody that wants to stick around and watch, and Matt, if he wants to, sorry. Um, guys, thanks for being here to talk about World War Cthulhu and Dark Regions Press. Um, for everybody watching live right now, if you'd like to uh, be put in the random drawing to win the, the two um, regular print editions of the book, books or the World War Cthulhu bundle, just send me an email right now and put World War Cthulhu in the title. Um, the email address is lovecrafteasine at gmail.com. That's lovecrafteasine at gmail.com. And what I'll do in a little bit is I use random.org uh, to uh, pick the winners. So, And then I'll, I'll send that information over to Chris and Brian and Glenn, and, and they'll get you taken care of. So. Sometime in the next few days here. So, sounds Thanks good. Thanks a lot for doing this, Mike. I appreciate it, man. Oh, thank you. We are salivating to get the book. <clears throat> yeah, this is going to be, yeah. I can say with full honesty and confidence that it's one of the most well-produced books that we've ever put out. So I don't think anybody will be disappointed. Um, it, did, it did take a bit longer, but like some others alluded to, compared to others in the small press, this really isn't that much of a turnover time with the amount that this project got expanded. So, uh, on time for holiday season, you know, a great Christmas gift for your loved ones, you know, a little more Cthulhu. So, it really came together beautifully. I, I couldn't be happier. Yeah. Yeah, good stories, good illustrations. Thanks for being here. Um, congratulations, Brian. And um, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, like I said, everybody watching, just send me an email if you want to get into the drawing and put World War Cthulhu in the title. Uh, Thanks for having around? us, Mike. Sorry? What'd you say? Brian, what'd you say? No, oh, he said thanks for having us, but I think... Oh, okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm half deaf. Okay. Oh, we're going to start a fight. <laughs> um, anybody wants to st stick around is welcome to. Otherwise, you just got to close your browser and that gets you out of here. So, so thanks a lot, right. guys. Have a good one, Mike. You too. Bye, thanks, good guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye, guys. Um... Again, the email address is, well, it looks like a lot of people have the email address already. Lovecrafteasing at gmail.com. So. I sent you five, so. <laughs> I see that. I only uh, I'll only. do the random drawing here in just a, just a few minutes, guys. Um, Rick. <laughs> oh, my God. I sound like a tip nerd. <laughs> wow. Okay, click. Um, hey, where, where, where can I download that app, that voice app you're using? <laughs> okay, Rick, do you know where you usually click the mute? Um, go up there on the right. There's a there's a settings button just to the left of the red phone looking thing. And click on there on your microphone. See if you've got some other choices on your microphone, and click save and see if that does the trick. Take it off the chipmunk version. <laughs> Now, I actually want to talk about one thing. Yeah. Uh, this is just a lot of people, uh, they come to Lovecraft through Call of Cthulhu or see a picture of Cthulhu. They've right. never really read Lovecraft, and they wonder how they can go about it. Well, there's something going on right now that they could use. Um, you know, in alt.horror.cthulhu in 1998, there was a read-along with in-depth discussion from a lot of really people who really knew Lovecraft. That was a long time ago. We tried to do it again in like 2004. It just fell apart. You could also get Tour to Lovecraft uh, by uh, Dan Harms, which right. kind of gives you notes about the stories. If you want to go on a weekly basis at Tor.com, they're going to be doing an individual of crafting story that they do a summary of, and then they have a discussion. 
Wayne, wasn't it sort of Lovecraft Kenneth Height, or am I remembering that wrong? Yeah, no, yeah, it's Kenneth Height. You're right. Um, okay, so go uh, to where dot com. Tor dot com. Tor dot com. Now the oh, thing okay. is, T -O -R. okay. Tor has its own issues in terms of like. Uh, there is a certain degree of PC-ness that infiltrates all of their uh, posting. Mm -hmm. So, like, one of the things they're going to comment on each time is, is the relationship between uh, what's written in the story and uh, HPL's racism or xenophobia. That's going to be a big part of their, their commentary. Nonetheless, uh, this is a chance for you to read each story and participate in a discussion um, they've already done The Shadow Out of Time and The Thing on the Doorstep, and the next one next week is published every Tuesday. The, the discussion is posted is The Terrible Old Man. So if there are readers out there who kind of want to have a, um, a read-along discussion, almost a Lovecraftian story club, book club, uh, this is going to be going on for at least several months on Tor.com. This is uh, great information, Matt. Okay, so I'm at tour.com, uh, but I don't see anything with Lovecraft on it. I know it's a big site, but... Do I sound okay now? Yeah, you do. You've got your Universal Translator working again. Yeah, it, the, I went through Google Plus because of all the problems I was having connecting, and I guess it screwed up the microphone. Okay, um, I, if you search uh, for Lovecraft reread... Okay. On their website? Yeah, they've got a search bar at the top right. Uh, it takes you to uh, the first <coughs> post in that list is Introduction to the HP Lovecraft Reread. Um, now, I found it. I'm going to post it on the message board for everybody. Okay, now notice that the two authors, frankly, before this, I never heard of them. You know, Ruthanna Emrys and Ann Pillsworth. She's, Ruth Ann Emrys is the one that wrote that, um, yeah, I mean, I just forgot the title, but it just came out on tour a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah that actually is um, The Litany of Earth. Now, right. Uh, right. Now, his book, this story is a, um, this is kind of interesting. He basically, I don't like it, okay, but like um, a lot of people do things to kind of tweak Lovecraft's nose. So the idea here is the people of Innsmouth were rounded up and treated like the Japanese in World War II and put in concentration camps. Right. And now they're out, and the government needs the help of one of them. And they've got this overarching, uh, they've got this blood, deep one, tainted blood, and they've got this overarching uh, knowledge of the history of the world and where it goes into the future and the beetle race that's going to succeed humankind. And... Uh, Essentially what he's done, at least as near as I can tell from this novella, is he has made this a kind of kumbaya, almost um, uh, Wiccan-type religion, and he pulled the fangs out of the monsters. Yeah, it's a because, she, isn't it? Or am I wrong? No, Rosanna, it's a guy. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Well, I think. Um, I, can be I haven't read the story, but from the sense of, uh, so I'll have to reserve judgment completely, but I... I don't think you're wrong from the descriptions I've heard of it. No, no, it, I, I read it because yeah. it's like you say, like, what happened to the diaspora of the people from Innsmouth who were scattered out to the camps or prisons or whatever? And the best story I ever read about this was The Doom That Came to Innsmouth by um, McNaughton right. because he took this story and he sucked you in to say, here these people were repressed for their religion, and you say, that's not very American, and then what does the Deep One's religion consist of? You know, it's like he really turns you on your ear on it and, and drags you to an unpleasant place. Well, this guy isn't doing that. He's basically uh, saying um, it's, this is in your – this is like uh, let's, let's turn Lovecraft on his head and say these aren't monstrous people. They are beings of wonder, which is like it really takes the horror out of it. I don't know where he's going to go with. He wants to keep going with this character, and I guess I'll read it. But um, it really, it sounds it like really sort of like the guy, the protagonist at the end of Shadow Over Innsmouth, how he his perspective. No, no. The, the thing is, he's, you think he's going to go out and accept human sacrifices? 
Mm. You know, yeah. at least I do. He's going to go live with the deep ones in Yenith Lai. This one is more like uh, the religion is not nearly so monstrous. There's no, there's no human sacrifice in there? Well, we don't know where he's going to go with it, but the whole idea is like uh, the evil um, U.S. government oppressed these people like the Japanese. And yeah, so they've got no reason to help the U.S. government, but now the FBI the, needs their help. You're interfering with their freedom of, of religion when you don't allow them to sacrifice humans. Right, you know, like, it's like to say, just to say that, like, um, you know, like, why aren't the Aztecs allowed free practice of their religion? Oh, because, you know, sometimes it involves skinning people. <laughs> Come on. Uh, it, it's like, so I actually wrote a commentary on his uh, short story saying that it was, it was well written, but he had certainly take the, taken the fangs out. Which to me that takes the interest out. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm going to read it. These two authors. Like I don't know them, you know, and I know a lot of mythos authors. I've at least run across their names. Pete, do you recognize the names? Uh, Pete stepped out for a second. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I, I really don't recognize the names. So, you know, this is a matter, they're probably part of Tor's stable of people who do this kind of project. So one reason I want to bring this up is so that uh, hopefully other mythos scholars or experts that I respect will go in there and add some kind of uh, counterbalance to the commentary. Yeah, I wonder what Tor's criteria was for selecting, because I've never, I haven't heard of these people, which doesn't mean... I mean, I'm not a clear yeah, new, 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 new blood has always been welcome. Yeah. yeah. You know, Pillsworth, if, if, we're yeah. Not, if we're not welcoming new blood into Lovecraftian literature, then just close up the book because it's all been done. No, I don't mean it in a negative way. I'm, I'm honestly curious how they came across these people. I'm not all saying right. they didn't have. So Pillsworth and Pillsworth just published a young adult novel called Summoned mm -hmm. for Tor, which is set in Arkham. Okay. okay. So, and it, ha it deals with um, a young man being h hired to work for uh, an ancient wizard. Well, and the thing about Emery's story is, you know, some people, it's not going to be their cup of tea, like Matt's, and yeah. some people, I know a lot of people love it, so, you know, it's just like anything else in the mythos. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and that's like the thing well. is, that, and that's absolutely the bottom line, be it Pete Rollick, be it Joe Pulver, be it Bob Price, be it Stan Sargent, be it Willem Pugmire, be it any one of a host of Lumley Campbell, um, you know, people are occasion are going to write things that other people don't enjoy. They're going to have takes that don't fit into other people's viewpoint of what this thing is or is not. Um, I'm glad they're doing long, this reread thing. As though. long as the work is well written, um. I think it's valid, whether whether we agree with it or not, because. But we lost Joe. I'm I'm glad you told us about this reread thing, Matt. Though, because I think that's going to yep. be valuable to a lot of, especially. Sure, this will also let us let us know about the these writers' chops. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like how what what good uh, I re I'm always in favor of finding out new people. Uh, new authors. It's just like it. Uh, it will be interesting to see what their take is as we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, this is a way for people new to Lovecraft to kind of do a comprehensive review of his work. Yeah. There is a real life parallel to finding out the deep ones weren't evil, if that was the truth. No, you're gonna bring up the Yazidis. Yeah. Because the villains of uh, the religion in the Middle East, which was used in the horror at Red Hook and Dig Me No Grave, which was supposedly evil devil worshippers and 
that was what was being widespread in all uh, travel books at the time. And uh, pulp writers got a hold of it, and uh, they aren't devil worshippers, and they're actually the people who were just stuck on that mountain that the uh, ISIS terrorists were trying to kill. Yeah. Yeah. I've been I've been doing you know, some research on 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 them and your Rick um I really appreciate you bringing them up because there here is a, a a organized religion I'm coming right back go ahead that really doesn't hasn't hasn't put down the tenets of their faith well they do have some religious books a lot of which were mis a lot of them are are written by people who think they know the religion yeah yeah but a lot of it's word of mouth, and there may be one book that's actually written, but there's no way to back that up. So it's a very interesting faith. Um, Essentially, I don't want to go into a whole theological discussion, but does the Buddha's in context? When the concept of Satan developed in the Middle East, it really, it really it was just God originally, and the devil got kind of added on later, and things like the serpent in the Garden of Eden were retrofitted to be filling with the devil. There was sort of two versions of the devil, or Satan, floating around. One where he's evil, and one, and you see this a little bit in the Book of Job, where he helps God run the earth, but he's sort of like the hatchet man who does all the rotten stuff. Right, right. And eventually... The Judeo Christian tradition said, oh, he's evil, rotten, cast down by God into hell. And the Ezidi kind of went the other way. Yeah. The Book of Job. <laughs> read, read the Book of Job very carefully. Satan's. Yeah, I agree. Satan and, Satan and God are like the brothers in trading places, the Eddie yeah. Murphy film. No, it, it, around it, and making bets to ruin people's lives. Right, right, right. It's um, not the devil. The devil is not the bad guy in that book. All right. So to to change the subject, because you don't want to stay on the subject, do you, My, uh, No, no. We can get off it. I just wanted to. What's read. everybody reading right now? I'm reading, or I just read, Challenge from Beyond. All right. <laughs> and awesome. you know, I got a little faked out. Okay. Because you know, I, I started look at the beginning and saying they're not saying who wrote each chapter. Yeah. So I looked at the front of the book, which has all the authors' names, and I assumed that was the order, which is which, and is only I think only Joe Pulver matches up, <laughs> which is like the second sex. So you know, it's look, you know, and Joe has, Joe's style is very Pulveresque, you know, in 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 his section. So I think I'm going along. And then I get to the back, you know, and then I go, oh, my God, they're all, I had everybody wrong. <laughs> now it makes more sense. I should have, I should have caught w Willem Pugmire's style. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Gwen and Brian uh, emailed me and when they were putting together authors for this, and they're like, can you suggest anybody else? And I didn't see Pete Rollick's name on there. I'm like, man, this is the king of the, uh, um, of these two types of things, you know, you got to have him there. So. And he ended up doing the last chapter. I did end up doing the last chapter. Of and something which got totally discombobulated in the middle. And I, I, you know, I read that and I was like, oh my god, what am I going to do with this? And, you know, you did, I think it worked. Job. Yeah, I, I think it worked out really well. You know, but when I was reading that, just to go back to, I'm going, uh, let's see, boy, Will, Will, Will and Pugmite did a great job of finishing this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Um, it's going to be Pete Rowling. How about you, Matt? What are you reading? Okay, um, don't feel bad about this. I am, I picked up Black Wings 1. Because I am so far behind in my TV Red stack, so oh, yeah. I'm trying to finish that, so I can have the second one read when the third one comes out. Okay. Can I mention something else? I got 
uh, yeah. the H.P. Lovecraft Society's Dreams of the, in the Witch House audio drama. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Hold on. Yeah, I actually, that I, I'm saving that the next time I have to drive down to Galesburg from here. It's a 45-minute drive, so... Uh, very well done, has an interesting framing device. Well, that's interesting because I listened to this all day today, The Dreams in the Witch House rock opera. How's that? I really enjoyed it. I mean, they had to make some concessions to the story to get it to work, but I think they did a great job. Who, who did that? Um... Polar Studios in association with the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. In fact, there is um, there's something. It is was there's a theme from a, a song or a song called "The Sleepwalker." Okay. By which, which seems to come from the rock opera. Is um, that written by uh, Mike Dallager and Anders Ringman? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't see that. That's those are the people. Yeah, I got it right here. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so yep. they included part of that in in this. I, I don't know at what point it comes in. Yeah, this is really well done. I really basically they it. use that. They have stuff by um, Troy Sterling Knees and Reba Clark added some extra music. Okay, so. We've got a uh, comment by, uh, I think, a new viewer. If you are, welcome. Carl Andrew Strack. He just commented on the message board. And I think this is worth talking about. Do people realize that HPL was actually an atheist in his views and too many folks want to associate him with any particular religion? I, I don't know that anyone's associating HPL with a religion. He was a, certainly was a atheist, but, you know, the... the these gods in his stories, uh, you know, he's writing fiction. This, these aren't his views. Right. And uh, the, but there and are these gods are actually super aliens. You know. There are people who, and there is a a path um, in pagan religions that's Lovecraftian in nature. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah. It, People out there have taken it seriously. And there are, beyond the, the Simon books, there are other books to, that talk about Lovecraftian magic as a, as a, as a religious path or a direction. So, yes, it does exist. Um, not something I support anymore. See what I did there? Um, I was even Lovecraft I didn't know what to do about that. Yeah. You no, know, I I seem to recall he was sort of like bemused that uh, anything like that would crop up. Right. Uh, go ahead, Rick. I'm sorry. You can get into a debate on how you handle the atheist angle in Lovecraftian fiction. I always felt, you know, even though, I mean, y y you can tell that Lovecraft's an atheist if you read very carefully. Mm -hmm. He's not clobbering you over the head with it. No. He's not, you know, you, you, in fact, even there were some concessions at times to religion, like Dream in the Witch House with the crucifix and whatever. But then, uh, you know, it was like in Bob Price and Richard Tierney, we get uh, religions actually being uh, refuted. God is Yog Sothoth and whatever, which does turn some people off. Right. And I always thought you should be neutral. You know, you don't have to, you can ignore religion, but don't actually refute it. Yeah, I don't, you can, I, I'm with you, Rick. You can detect the atheism in there, but he's, well, I can't say any say it any better than that. He's not clobbering you over the head with it, and... Um, I yeah, I disagree. It's he's not trying to preach to anybody about right. atheism. Um, so did any of uh, you ever read the Coach's Midnight Diner, Jesus versus Cthulhu edition? It's on my shelf. I've read a couple stories. 
there, mm -hmm. most of it is just kind of Christian fiction where Cthulhu is an aspect of Satan. Right. Or another name for Satan. But there's one really terrifically good story in there. Did you read it? Yeah. Um, and the, the, the author has made some really good headway with his, his ideas. Can't think of well, this. Is, it's like uh, Jesus has to hook up with Satan. They kind of go by Heaven's Weapons Locker. They pick up Mjolnir, and they got to go down to Relia because Cthulhu's waking up. Right. <laughs> It, it was really a fun story. Uh, so, you know, it sounds you can a little find like interesting writing just about anywhere. Something like Patrick Thomas puts together in his um, no, 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 no. Uh, Patrick. Ah, uh, he's got so this was, wild bar where the god, the devil, the Norse gods, the Greek gods, and the mythos entities kind of all in. Visited at some point. Ooh. It was no, kind of no, a not, not to give too much away, but it was like, like Cthulhu was a special creation in this. It's like he's created as a warrior, and he dreams of battles. You know, and so like it was, it's like no aspect that humans had ever seen. It, it was really, it was a very interesting story. I don't think I've even heard of those. Yeah, it's it's not a well-known volume. It's out there. It's still in print, I think. Um, Rhesus, I know this is a nickname. Uh, if I'm saying his name right on the board, just mentioned that he's finishing up, since we're talking about what we're reading, just finishing up that which should not be, which I don't think I've made a secret that I've really enjoyed that book. Now, uh, it, is, it, is, it is more of a Derlethian bent, but I really I don't say that in a negative way. It's by Brett J. Talley, That Which Should Not Be. And I, I don't usually like books with the Derlethian bent, but I, I just really enjoy this book. I really enjoy the atmosphere of it, um, the framing of it, you know, the wraparound story and everything. I, I, I love that book. So It was somewhat a return to uh, more gothic horror fiction. There's a lot of Dracula in that book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. You know, it's another interpretation. And if if every if every book we read, Lovecraftian or weird fiction book we read, was was similar, we we'd, we'd get pretty bored. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're a, you're absolutely right. And um, you know, I, I welcome other people bringing new ideas into the mythos. Um, I'm still playing out some of mine. You know, I, I hope to be playing out new ideas for for decades to come. Uh, you also you can do a more realistic uh, version of the Dilethian struggle, like F. Paul Wilson's uh, ally and the other is right. And we yeah. talked about uh, his books. In fact, we had F. Paul Wilson on the show. And we talked to him about um, the Repairman Jack series, right. which I highly recommend. Again, even though it's more of a Dorlethian bent, it's th th those are really fun reads. But the equivalent of the Elder Gods does not come up. You see, what Dorlethian, if you always read his introduction, say said the Elder Gods are indifferent to mankind, but they don't come off that way, and that's why Brian Lumley made them good guys. Mm -hmm. But when you read Wilson, they are indifferent. Right. Yeah, that's true. And even the ally, guys, and don't give a damn about us. Yeah, even the ally, he's not he's not defending us. He just wants to win the the marble earth over uh, over the guy he's fighting. You know. Yeah. Um, a. Dean Borman says, "Question: What does the panel think?" I'm. Uh, I love this question. Uh, what does the panel think of H. P. Lovecraft against the world against life by Michael? I'm going to say this wrong, Holobolek. Uh, it's interesting, but a little dense. Um, what do I think personally? You guys comment, but I did not think it was dense at all. I thought it was really readable. It's one of my favorite non... Uh, it's one of my favorite commentaries on Lovecraft. So, do you guys read that one? Yeah, I read it a long time ago, and it, I, I sort of... If, you, if you're if you reading my Lovecraftian work, yeah, I, I don't... 
I'm kind of taking an opposite position on that. Okay. I, I think, and I've had this argument, and this, well, not argument, I've had this discussion with a bunch of people. I think that Lovecraft um, may have been hiding a different kind of message in some of his subtexts. I think if you look at stories like the Dunwich Horror and Dreams in the Witch House and The Shadow Over Innsmouth, there is an interesting little pattern there that emerges that suggests that while the universe may be anti-anthropocentric, mm -hmm. there is a suggestion that mankind through some transformative process, whether it be interbreeding or discovery of advanced mathematics, has a place in that universe and can transcend its current existence. Are you talking about the singularity? Uh, maybe, but, you know, <laughs> um, maybe the, the singularity is one path. Yeah. If you look at the, the, the shadow over his mouth, he says, I will dwell in wandering glory forever. Well, again, that sounds like heaven, right? Yeah. You know, yeah, um, interpretation, yeah. at the end of the Dunwich Horror, the, the thing, the half-breed, is extremely powerful, but still kind of human. He still cries out for his father at the end. Yeah, you know, you got a really good point, Pete, because, it, yeah, not all of his stories are mankind doesn't matter at all. We had this discussion before. I framed it this way. Um, are, is, are humans ants or are they cattle? You know, in some of Lovecraft's stories and some Lovecraftian stories were ants, and others were cattle, and others were something what more. I would say, what I think he's, he's hinting at in some stories is that it wouldn't take much to push us to the next level. Mm -hmm. To where we might be able to have a bigger part in the universe. Or at least not be its victim all the time. Well, which um, begs the question... Following along the lines was, of uh, the shadow out of time, Yeah. where the successive race is going to be these intelligent beetles, mm -hmm. um, Laird Barron wrote a story... I forget which anthology it was in of his, his collection, where human minds were accepted into the hive mind of these beetles uh, so that the human mind and experience would participate in the future of the planet. So Laird Barron did some, of course, unfortunately to do that, they had to be devoured by the beetles, but, you know. <laughs> right, uh, yeah. The, yeah, and... And I, you're, you made, in, the, in your side conversation here, you made the joke about the MyGo putting brains in the jars being transformative. But, you know, I, if I remember the story correctly, those minds are immortal. And they get to travel the universe. I'd love to do that. Okay, MyGo, if you're listening out there, here's a candidate. You know, this begs the question of, what what form did these super aliens like Cthulhu? They they evolved to where they are today. Where what were they before? Where what did they evolve from? You know, there's a story called The Guardian of the Book by Henry Hass, right? Which really needs to be deconstructed thoroughly by somebody. But if you read it carefully, it suggests that Cthulhu was some human or humanoid person on another planet who looks like his brain gets ripped out from him and somehow becomes the creature we know and love in right Rie. Yeah, did you guys watch my interview with when I was at Sandy's house, Sandy Peterson's house watching movies. We went out to lunch and I he started talking about you know, one possible future of mankind uh, at the end of time becomes Cthulhu. Something to that effect. I'm not doing his words justice. But uh, it's one of the videos at the YouTube page. No, I, I haven't seen it. You've got to be careful what you 
what you come to comprehend. I mean, did you read Barbara Hambly's The Darwath Trilogy? She wrote that it was The Time of the Dark was the first one about these horrible manta ray-like monsters that were in this one dimension eating all the people or whatever. Mm -hmm. And a wizard was trying to comprehend them to find out where they were coming from, how to defeat them. So he became as they were, <coughs> and he became one of them. You know, so who knows if like these wizards or uh, scholars reading these horrible ancient tomes trying to manipulate the old ones might become what they are trying to manipulate. Yeah. 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 yeah I, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Go. Go. You, you need to talk. Uh, no, I'm, I'm changing the subject a little bit slightly, but you talked about the brain in the jar being immortal and traveling and everything. You, you know, there's two sides to that. I'm not so certain I would want to be a brain in a jar. There's a story, I wish I could remember the title. Um, it talks about the, it, the, the, the protagonist is a private detective, and it's been a couple of years since I read it, but this is more or less the way it goes. He's looking into the disappearance of a friend of his, or uh, something to that effect, tracks down where he possibly is to this warehouse, and he, make a long story short, finds out that these mad scientists have taken his friends and put his brain in a jar, you know, just like uh, what we're talking about. And they catch him sneaking around, they catch the detective sneaking around, and they say, uh, you know, they hold him captive, and they said, you know, um, I'll, they basically taunt him and say, I bet you think that we're going to do that to you. And he's like, yeah. And he goes, he's like, no, we're not going to do that. We did it three weeks ago. Yeah, I think it's a CJ story. Is it CJ Henderson? Uh, somebody else. like that rings a bell. Yeah. No, it's, it's somebody else because Mike, Referenced it before, and I think I found it, but I didn't. I couldn't find what anthology you could get it in. Yeah, I read it in a nonfiction um, themes on science fiction book I have. I'm looking for it now. I've got it on Kindle. Yeah, that it, it sounded like something like that when I was looking it up. Yeah, you know, there's a to, to expand on this. There's a story by Larry Niven, and he was about this guy who's traveling the universe looking for ways to extend his life. And um, he sits, he, he's, he's, fur, he's the human who's traveled furthest from Earth at this okay. point. He's surrounded by strange beings, whatever, and he's approaching a thousand years old. And um, he sits down next to a guy, this other creature, and they're talking, and it's like, yeah, I've been doing the same thing. You know, been trying to stay alive longer and longer and longer. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm into my third million years, and it's I still trying to stay alive. <laughs> and you know, the guy realizes that just no matter how much time you you have, it's never going to be enough. Yeah. For sure. Well, if, if you look at all history, whenever there's been a war, it's hard to find one side which everybody's bad and one and another side which everybody's good. Oh yeah. You look at the closest thing being World War Two. We as the Allies had Stalin on our side. Oh yeah. And the Axis, if you go into everybody who was in the Axis. Finland was part of the Axis. Right. And they just wanted to get their territory back from the Soviet Union. Right, right, right. So you, you've got good guys on an evil, fighting for an evil cause, and evil guys fighting for a good cause. Right. And I found the book, Science, uh, Science Fiction and Philosophy from Time Travel to Superintelligence, edited by Susan Schneider. Yeah. Uh, the story is by, let me go back here, Brain, it's called Brain in a Vat by John Pollock. Oh, okay. Yeah, that so, sounds... Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, that sounds what you, like you said the last time. 
Yeah, with that, they let me... We're not going to remove your brain. We already did three months ago. With that, they let me go. I found my way back to my office in a daze. For some reason, I haven't told anybody about this. I can't make up my mind. I'm racked by the suspicion that I really am a brain in a vat, and all I see around me is just a figment of the computer. After all, how could I tell? If the computer program really works, no matter what I do, everything will seem normal. Maybe nothing I see is real. It's driving it's driving me crazy. So, good story. Sort of a matrix fall out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know when that story was written, but it's it's it it's yeah, it's definitely a forerunner. It's been quite a while. Yeah. The other story that that's in this vein that we should probably mention is uh, the movie Dark City. Oh yeah, great movie. Which you know, for me, the the, the the bald guys, I can't remember what they were called. They are the my go. I mean, this is, it's just so, so manipulative and, and so Lovecraftian in nature. It's, it's perfect. It really is. As a matter of fact, in the first beautiful, wonderful book, Dead, by, Dead But Dreaming, Miskatonic River Press, in the introduction, um, Kevin Ross actually references that movie, uh, and he talks about the wrong turn that some writers take, in his opinion, in Lovecraftian and fiction. Uh, perhaps the best example of what I mean by the dark epiphany occurs in the film Dark City. Uh, the characters are searching for a place called Shell Beach, an elusive sunny haven that figures in the bizarre, dark urban mystery they are desperately trying to unravel. They are hacking away at a city wall with pickaxes, believing that Shell Beach lies just beyond. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen Dark City, you might want to plug up your ears for the next 30 seconds. Instead, when their hacks break through and the bricks fall away, they behold only a vast starry void as far as the eye can see in all directions. For the city in which they live is actually a spaceship, and they are captives subjected to experimentation by an alien race who are trying to figure out what makes humans tick. So. so, yeah, Dark City. Good example. Yeah. I got to step out, guys. Um, yeah, I got to go, too. It's, so. it's bedtime. Uh, can I Yep. offline talk to you, Mike, about a, some guests for a possible show? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, thanks, Pete. And for everybody that... Um, emailed me. I'm going to do the drawing as soon as we go offline, and I'll email the winners within 10 minutes. So, thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, guys.